Hello and welcome to another episode of Her Hoop Stats Unplugged. As always, you're here today with Megan Gower and I am joined today by Calvin Wetzel from our Her Hoop Stats team. Hey Calvin, how's it going? Hey, I'm good, Megan. How are you doing? Doing good. Excited to have you back on. It feels like it's been a little while. I feel curiously here more often. Yeah, this might be the first time in 2023 that I remember. Yeah, I think so. Well, we're actually a full month into 2023 somehow. So yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we've got a lot to talk about today because there's been a fair amount of chaos in the last week. I feel like I say this every week that I start this podcast is there's been chaos because everything keeps changing. But I think we have to start this week in the Big Ten because we had three undefeated teams left in the country entering the week with, or last week with South Carolina, LSU, and Ohio State. And since that, Ohio State has lost not one, not two, but three games. So it's been a, an interesting week in the Big Ten, for sure. Um, so Ohio State, they dropped. Their first game was a whole game against Iowa, then a road game in Indiana. I think both not really concerning losses necessarily. Those are two top ten teams. And then they follow that up with a loss against Purdue as well, which I think starts to raise the, the alarms a little bit more than those first two losses. Yeah, definitely a, a game you would have thought they would bounce back after those two. I feel like, it's, especially like when you're a team that is, you know, undefeated that late into the season or is on that big of a winning streak, I, I feel like you see all the time one of two things happens like when you take that first punch finally. You either like respond right away and bounce back in a big way or it just starts like a really bad slide. Obviously, that's the one that's happened to Ohio State, but. I still wouldn't say I would be like worried per se about them, uh, but they do need JC Sheldon back. I think that's a lot more clear now. Uh, we, I still don't know if we know when she's coming back. I, I'm i not sure if this team is necessarily a Final Four team without her after what we've seen, but you can kind of chalk up the the all three of those losses. Obviously, two of them were understandable anyway with the competition, but just the shooting performances. They've had three of their worst shooting nights in a row, like of the season, which isn't going to continue. And that's a problem for them, maybe more than other teams, because when you rely on the press so much and you're missing all your shots, you can't set up the press then. And it just completely takes you out of like your whole style of what you want to do. So if shots start going in. I think they'll be fine, but there's definitely a blueprint now. Yeah, exactly. They really struggle, especially with their three-point shooting in all of those games. So I think that's that's a big piece of it and something you can talk up to not being a real long-term concern, especially for a team that has found plenty of success shooting the ball the rest of the season. But like you said, when they're so heavily reliant, reliant on that press, I think that's caused them some real issues over the last week, um, particularly the Purdue game I think you saw maybe the, the effects of that more just in that the other ones, I think, you know, there's some other elements that could play into the press being less effective. You've got kind of better guards and Kate and Clark and Grace Berger, and they're just going to be better at handling that. But with the, the Purdue game, especially, I think a lot of it can be just chalked up to a bad night of shooting. Yeah. Well, and a good night for Purdue yeah. too, because in those <laughs> first two games, they played great competition, but neither Iowa or Indiana really shot well either. I don't think any of them shot, 30% or better from three in those two games, either team. Purdue had a great shooting night. Uh, so Ohio State got a little bit unlucky coming off those two losses too. But I think the other thing with them that maybe is exposed a little bit um, in these last three games is that when you get them into the half court, they don't really have great interior defense. I think, did you talk about that in your article? I yeah. Would say? Yeah, so, so you know. But uh, when you get – when you go up against a team that has like a Sonano or a McKenzie Holmes that you don't need good interior defense. If you're not letting the other team cross <laughs> half court, cause who cares if you're going to force turnovers against that press, but if you're not able to get into that press, cause you're missing shots, or if you're playing teams that are able to break that press because they have a Caitlin Clark or Grace Berger or whoever experienced guard, then that interior defense is a big deal. So that'll be definitely interesting to watch too, when they play teams that, that match up well like that. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of my biggest concerns with them if you're looking at is this like a Final Four team? Because if they get a matchup in the NCAA tournament kind of leading up to that where they're going to have an experienced guard or a good backcourt that can defend or to deal with the press, and then you've also got a big that it doesn't even have to be one of the country's best bigs, just like a good big, I think they're going to have a hard time keeping up in those types of games. Yeah, and when you look at who they're likely to play in those in those matchups, obviously like Indiana again could mm-hmm. be one of them, but South Carolina, Stanford, UConn, like th- those teams can break presses, mm-hmm. and they have interior presences. So, uh, who know? I don't know. I don't know if Ohio yeah. State, even if they are maybe one of the best four or five teams when J.C. Sheldon comes back, I don't know if they match up well with competition that they're going to be facing at that level it might be more of a second weekend team than a third weekend team if they don't fix some of those holes yeah exactly I think when you look at like a final four it's I think it's really hard to get to the final four without being like a really solid rebounding team and a real really solid team defending in the lane I think those are two of the biggest things that you kind of like year in and year out the teams that get to that last weekend usually have those two things going for them yeah no question so I think that's been interesting. I also think it's interesting now because I think the Big Ten race gets a lot more interesting in that before this, you're like, okay, Ohio State's going to win the Big Ten. Well, that might not be the case anymore. Um, I think they fell in the standings, right? Yeah, there's uh, they're fourth behind Indiana, Iowa, Maryland, who all have one or two losses. The Big Ten race is fascinating to me because yeah. this is what I was looking at the most uh, right before we hopped on here. There are all sorts of massive games left. Like so many of these teams at the top have really tough schedules in the month of February. Iowa versus Indiana, twice. Iowa versus Maryland, twice. Maryland versus Ohio State, twice. Indiana rematch against Ohio State. Like all of those teams that are right there at the top with a chance to win it, play each other again, most of them twice. So who knows? Right now, I like... I don't know if there is a front runner, Indiana, if you had to pick one, but you, we can't say right now because there's so many relevant games left and it's really going to come down to those matchups between these teams. If if any of those matchups that still happen twice, if if one of these teams is able to sweep the other team, that's going to put them in, in position to win this. If, if Indiana can sweep Iowa or if Iowa can sweep Indiana or go three and one against Indiana and Maryland, like that's going to really determine who comes out of this. And then you have Illinois and Michigan still kind of knocking on the door too. They play each other, I believe Thursday. We're recording this on Tuesday. I think the loser of that one's probably out of it, but the winner of that one still could be a little bit of a dark horse too, given how tough the schedules are of the teams ahead of them. So it's going to be a really fun race. Yeah, exactly. I think really any of those, like you said, the, the top four, and then maybe a, a Michigan or Illinois and still the pitcher too, can kind of win it. And then especially I think if you start throwing it, if you get another loss like the Ohio State loss to Purdue or one of these other teams kind of knocking off a, a game that one of those top four is expected to win makes it, I think, even more of a close race with kind of that next year of teams too. Yeah, and with all these big games, it puts pressure on those other games, too, because like it, you have so many landmines on the schedule that you have to take care of business in those games that you should win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you know, all these teams, too. And then, of course, when we get to the, the Big Ten tournament, I think that's going to be fascinating as well in terms of like who was able to win that, because you're going to get third and fourth matchups, I think, between some of these teams as you get into that. Yeah, this could be a tournament that the five or six seed could win. It wouldn't shock me. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be very interesting. It's also going to be, like, very interesting from a a bracket perspective because, I mean, like, Indiana, Iowa, Maryland, Ohio State, and Michigan are all probably in that that hosting conversation on all kind of on top of each other right now. And it's going to really depend how this last stretch of the the season and then that tournament goes in terms of where all those teams end up falling. Yeah, exactly. Like we said, every single one of these teams has at least one or two losses left on the schedule. So yeah. it's the, the resume is going to look different in a month than it does now. So who knows? It'll be fun. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I feel like that's the case in like the ACC too. It's like so crazy at the top that you're like, okay, this could fall <laughs> five different ways too. It's going to be very interesting to watch how kind of it all plays out. The Big 12 too, but I think that has less implication on your 
title picture i'm not like i don't think any of those teams are even probably gonna end up posting but it is still an interesting race yeah all of these conferences are so much more interesting than they were i don't know three years ago or whatever like mm-hmm. it's just <laughs> i mean the sec has your top two which we'll get to but but these other power conferences are really starting to like blossom into into fun fun leagues with full of parody and I, it's just, it's a, like a college basketball wide trend, part of a larger trend, but it's makes the month of February so much more fun. Yeah, exactly. And otherwise a time that would be a little bit boring, just conference matchups is all of a sudden like every day that there's big, like a big 10 matchup or an ACC matchup. It's like something crazy is bound to happen pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Speaking of the SEC, yeah, the, there's definitely a top two there. I think we've seen that pretty clearly, especially last night. LSU knocked off Tennessee, which was the third undefeated team in SEC play. Um, and we did South Carolina is obviously like we could talk about them, but they're they're the clear number one. I think the LSU question though is still like so fascinating, trying to decide like how good this team is. I think it's clear that they're good. The, the question is how good. Yeah, I, I, I love watching this debate play out on <laughs> Twitter or like wherever people have like really strong opinions about it. I kind of do too, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I think LSU is really, really good. And I think I've probably said this before on this podcast, like I care more about how you play than who you play. And, like, LSU hasn't had the craziest schedule. It's starting to get tougher. And, obviously, when they get to South Carolina, that'll be really tough. But, it, like, what else you want them to do other than beat everyone by 50? You know, yeah. like, that's the same thing that UConn would do against that schedule. It's the same thing that South Carolina would do against that schedule. And they're starting to beat some good teams. Like you said, Tennessee. I've kind of been a Tennessee hater all year. But <laughs> they're actually it's still a pretty good win. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I mean, they were starting to figure some things out. Alabama, I love Alabama. LSU went in there and won by 38. South Carolina, by the way, played Alabama a week later and only won by 13. So take that for what you will about how good of a win (laughs) it is to beat Alabama by 38. Uh, And then, like, Arkansas twice. One of them wasn't even close. That's a good team, too. So (laughs) I don't know. I I don't buy, like, the LSU hasn't played anyone, therefore they suck. Like, that. (laughs) no, I think (laughs) it's a Final Four team. And... It would not surprise me at all if they beat South Carolina. I don't think they're going to get run out of the gym. If nothing else is going to be pretty close. And and people will finally start to to pick up on, maybe not everybody, but I think that game is going to show a lot of people what LSU can do um, against really high-level competition. We'll see. But I this is, this is definitely – this might even be the second-best team in the country to me, maybe. Definitely top four. Okay. I I think they're good. I don't know if I'm sold on them being as high as you have them. It's just still because, like, I think that Alabama, the 38 Alabama win stand, point Alabama win stands out to me. Like, that's a really, really good win. The Tennessee win is good, but it was pretty close last night. I, for me, it's just, like, it's that gap. We're, we're going to see them play South Carolina, and I think they could still be the second, third best team in the country, even if they lose to South Carolina. Carolina I wish we would just see them play someone that kind of falls somewhere in that like 2 to 25 or inch (laughs) (laughs) they basically are gonna play the number one team clearly the number one team in the country and then they're playing all the rest of the SEC is all this like 25 plus type range (laughs) depending I mean it depends what metric you look at I guess but like if you're talking about in terms of like a poll and Tennessee might be a top 25 team but it's you know a fringe top 25 team um, and it's like, I think it's so hard to measure them without seeing that because as much as like, I think there's a lot of credit due for beating everyone you're supposed to beat and beating them mostly by a lot of points as well. I don't think we can say that many teams have beat everyone they're supposed to beat at this point, but I think there's a difference in that like top group, especially like that, you know, like top 10 type tier. And we haven't really seen them play any of those games. So I think it's hard to judge without the data point. And I think we'll be able to infer more after we kind of see how close they play South Carolina. But I just, like, I really wish there was some game in between there to kind of get a better feel. I think it's hard. Like, I think they're really good. I think they're definitely a second weekend team. 
if they have enough to get to a national championship is the one thing like I question or like get to a final four, get to a national championship, just because I think we've seen them win in different ways too, but it's just like, can they win in different ways against top competition that they're going to see when they get to like a second weekend? Because I don't know that they've played a team that they're going to see in like a elite eight game yet. Yeah, it's a good point. Like, because LSU is probably, you mentioned like the two to 25 range that they haven't really played yet. And like, you mm-hmm. like Tennessee, maybe fringe top 25. I think Alabama is borderline top 25, yeah. in my opinion, maybe 25 to 30. But the SEC kind of has those fringe top 25 teams, and then they have the top two, and no one in between. And, but LSU is also probably in that two to 25 range. I don't actually think they're the best team in the country. So, right. You're right. They like it's a good point. They haven't really played anyone in that same range as they are. So they've beaten everyone they're supposed to beat, which is everyone on their schedule so far. If they lose to South Carolina, like they're supposed to lose that game also. Right. But how do you do against the teams that you're not necessarily supposed to beat or lose to? You're supposed to be right there with. And but if if they hang with South Carolina, even if it's you know a foul game in the last minute, they lose by five. Like to me. That solidifies what I think that they are in that tier where they should be, uh, you know, playing even with a team like South Carolina. Otherwise, you're talking about, yeah, maybe maybe a top 10 team, top top six. I don't know, but not necessarily in that tier competing for number one. But yeah, I don't know. I I think a lot of people are going to be be shut up a little bit. And I I don't like Kim Mulkey. I don't think (laughs) so. I like I'm not. I'm not on here like emotionally happy about it, mm-hmm. but <laughs> just if I'm being like intellectually honest with myself, yeah. I feel like LSU is absolutely a Final Four contender and, and a Final Four favorite, and I think I think we're gonna see it. But you're right; they haven't proven it yet. That's just what I think. I don't know that. Right. I know that about South Carolina. Mm-hmm. I only think that about LSU. You know. Yeah, I think they have a lot of the right pieces, right? Like, they're a good rebounding team. Angel Reese has been fantastic. You're going to have the best player on the floor in a lot of matchups. I think that's important. They've found ways to win differently. I think you saw Alexis Morris against Tennessee was really the star. It wasn't necessarily all Angel Reese. So they've shown a lot of the things that you look for when you're looking for, like, can this team win the national title? But I think just that, like, lack of top competition – is it still raises some questions in terms of like it just it's hard to compare against just like the set that they have like the data points that we have so far in terms of like where does this team stand in that top group yeah and it's not it it's kind of their fault but it's not entirely their fault because uh, they could have scheduled a lot better in the non-conference obviously but <laughs> the sec didn't really do them any favors right. either because i the tenant like preseason i mean i got on here talked about how tennessee was overrated or whatever but the polls had them as a top five team like that was supposed to be a top five opportunity for lsu the other night uh i guess last night when they beat tennessee and now it's not even a top 25 win and that's not lsu's fault but (laughs) like the sec not giving them anyone outside of south carolina who can fit fit in that tier is just kind of uh you know it, it didn't do them any favors but we'll see they'll get they'll get at least one shot and probably two at South Carolina because I don't know March is chaos so we're gonna clip this and I'm gonna be wrong but I don't (laughs) see who else is getting to the SEC championship game other than South Carolina at LSU when it comes to the conference tournaments so I think they'll get two shots and honestly they only need to win one of those to prove it to me they go one and one like I'm sold yeah, I mean, I think a win over South Carolina pretty much sells it very easily. Yeah. If you can beat South Carolina, I think you, you're definitely in that conversation. But yeah, I agree. I would expect them to get two shots at it. I think it's more of a matter of can they keep it close. I don't expect them necessarily to win either. But if it can keep it close, I think you can kind of sell that you're a part of that top group. Um, but otherwise, I think it's hard to tell just Like the rest, I mean, the rest of their schedule is just like, other than that South Carolina game, like none of this is exciting. Georgia, Texas A&M is having an awful year. (laughs) Ole Miss is, I mean, they're maybe better than expected, but like still not great. It's just like the whole SEC is kind of having a down year minus South Carolina, which is, is making it harder, I think, to judge this team. Yeah, I, 
I have a question for you on it because what I think is interesting is that the difference between like team strength and resume because LSU is obviously very good. Are they top 10? Are they top four? We don't know for sure, but their resume doesn't have any of those signature wins on it. It has the fringe top 25 wins we talked about and that's it. It'll change if they beat South Carolina, but as our resident bracketologist, as you are, <laughs> who has taken the Joe Lunardi course, so you have the certified stamp or whatever, <laughs> what does LSU have to do? Like, where, what are the seed implications for them of, like, that South Carolina game? Like, are they – if they win every game except that game and lose to South Carolina again in the conference championship, go whatever in two, two loss to South Carolina, like, are they a one seed? I don't think so. I don't, like, know how you would – I think it's hard to tell because, like, there's just not a, like, a historical data point where you can be like, oh, this team is like this LSU team that played literally <laughs> no one and then we had, like, the second best net in the country and all this stuff. So it's it's really hard to decide what the committee is going to do with them. But I just – I don't know how you could justify putting them on the one line if they don't beat South Carolina at some point. I think it's honestly maybe hard to justify even beating South Carolina just because they don't have the quality – like the number of quality wins that other teams are going to have. So right now, if you look at like their Q1 wins, LSU is 4-0 in Quadrant 1. And then you've got um, teams like South Carolina has played eight games in that quad. UConn's played 12. Stanford's played eight. Indiana's played seven. Notre Dame's played nine. It's like it's hard to say that a team that's only played four games in that, that quadrant has like – is going to end up on the one line, especially if that becomes, you know, four and two that they are in Q1 when they lose to South Carolina. If that makes it even harder argument to put them on the one line. Yeah. So you think even if they beat South Carolina once, finish I think it's, one, they're still I think there's the a line? chance that they end up on the one line, but I think it kind of depends what happens with everyone else. Okay. I think it's going to depend – what does Indiana do for the rest of the season? What does UConn do for the rest of the season? What does Stanford do for the rest of the season? Because I think those three teams just have so many more quality wins right now than LSU does. So what if LSU goes undefeated, beat South Carolina, beat them again in the conference championship? They have to be a one seed then, right? Yeah, I would think they would end up on the one line then. I yeah, I think if you have two wins over South Carolina, you're probably yeah. on the that one kinda, line. That can erase yeah. a lot of other blemishes on the, on the strength and yeah. part of your resume if you get those two. Yeah, it is, yeah. you know, it just occurred to me, you were asking, you said there's not really a precedent, and there's not, and you were mm-hmm. asking about that in our Slack, I remember the other day, and no one really had a good answer. It did just occur to me, though, that, I mean, the committees are different, but there is kind of a precedent, you could say, on the men's side with Gonzaga, maybe. It's different, because with Gonzaga, yeah. it's almost flipped. Where but they, they play, often, they play yeah, good they, teams in a non-conference, and then they play. I mean, the WCC is great. People hate on <laughs> it, but it's not a power conference. Uh, you know, they get St. Mary's, BYU, a couple, and we don't have to get off into men's. But like, it feels a little bit similar, right? In terms of right. like some of those Gonzaga teams of the last five years, and the men's committee has given them some respect, has put them <laughs> on the one line in those years. So. I don't know if the women's committee will treat it the same, but uh, yeah, it probably does come down to how much they value, like how good are you versus how good is your resume, which is different. Because uh, uh, yeah, I agree with you. They don't have a a one seed resume if they don't beat South Carolina, unless those teams that you just rattled off there, like multiple of them just kind of fall apart. Right. Because yeah, I think the other thing that stands out is like when you move on to like, quadrant two wins they have four there too so like most yeah. of their games are in like quadrant three of seven games in quadrant four like UConn doesn't hasn't played a single quadrant four game yeah. all of their games are That's... quad three or better <laughs> right there's the thing about LSU schedule is like there are teams who play automatic wins mm-hmm. and then there's like the teams that LSU played and it's not yeah. even like you could play like the 250th best team and that's like an automatic win you know, you pay that team to come in to your place and lose by 40. And then you could play like the 360th best team who would get absolutely run out of the gym 
by the 250th best team. And like, that's the category of teams that LSU played for two straight months. So like, they really should have at least scheduled teams in the 200s in quadrant three, but they didn't. So that is kind of their fault. I don't really feel bad for them if they don't get in one seat, but I do think they're a very good basketball team. Yeah, exactly. I think they're going to probably be seated lower than how good they actually are, unless they somehow would. I don't expect them to beat South Carolina twice, right? Like, I think that would be pretty shocking. So I feel like they're going to end up seated lower than they actually are in terms of how good they are, just because they haven't played anyone. I Which mean, is not going to be fair to whoever else either. Oh, yeah. It's going to suck for whoever has to play them. Yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, but they're, I mean, their opponent's average margin is still negative. Like, they, (laughs) it's so bad. It's like, you can't, there's really, like, there is no comparison. (laughs) It's so bad. (laughs) No, yeah, it is true. This isn't something you see very often. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something else. I don't know. It's a choice. I think, yeah, I think people are going to be annoyed no matter where they get seated because people are going to be, I think they're too high because they didn't play anyone or they're going to think that like, it's not fair that they have to play as LSU in like a sweet 16 round yeah, as like yeah. a, <laughs> you know, a, what, if they lose most of their games, I don't think it's like a question that they're like a four and some one seed is going to have to play them in the, the sweet 16. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's going to be probably one of the biggest heated, <laughs> heated like online discussions on selection Sunday. Can't yeah. wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if they end up on the four line, no, everyone sees it's gonna be like that's not the four I want. Though I feel like there's yeah. a lot of teams like that though. Like Tennessee is gonna end up being like an eight seed. <laughs> I feel like, and I would not yeah. want Tennessee as my eight seed either. <laughs> no, true, true. Imagine being the one seed in the same. Oh God. Like, uh, so having yeah. the eight and the four on the same path. <laughs> that would be like just really unfair to that one scene. I would feel very bad for whoever that is. <laughs> it would. That yeah. would be like the committee is almost like just intentionally sabotaging yeah. you at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yep. it won't be UConn. <laughs> <laughs> it'll probably yeah. be Indiana, is who it'll happen to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It should be interesting. For sure. But yeah, we will see how that all falls out. I would hope that they would put them in the same thing. I guess that hopefully, well, honestly, like I was going to say, because like they have played each other enough, but they only play each other once in conference play too. So like, mm-hmm. there's not that many rules that would prevent that from happening when you yeah. only played once. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. You took the course. Is it that if you play once in the regular season, you can't meet until the second round twice. You can't mm-hmm. meet until the sweet 16 and three times you can't meet until the elite eight. That right? Yeah. That's, I believe okay. that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, but then none of these teams are gonna play three times. So, yeah, not yeah. LSU and any of those top teams. No. Yeah, yeah, which is an unfortunate one of the Arkansas many. Arkansas is probably the best yeah. team that they have a chance of playing three times. Yeah, if they played them in in the tournament at some point, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there anyone else they play twice here? There's probably a couple other ones here, but yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't know if there's anyone like good though. Decent, <laughs> they no. Twice, yeah. yeah. They don't play Alabama twice. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I feel like the SEC schedule is like kind of as much as like the SEC is also not that great. Like the schedule kind of sucks in that like none of these top teams play each other <laughs> that much during the regular season either. Yeah, even like by SEC standard. Yeah, you're right. Like yeah. they get <laughs> LSU's teams that they get twice are like the bottom tier teams for the most part outside of Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then like South Carolina only gets LSU once, and they only get Tennessee once. Do they maybe get Alabama twice? But like, still, it's just like, yeah, it's not very exciting. Is basically no, what it comes down no, to. They it's all really get... the opposite of what we talked about at the beginning with the Big Ten, with all these teams playing each other twice in February. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, South Carolina doesn't even get Alabama twice. They just had them once. They get Georgia twice, which I guess that game was a little interesting, but still. Would have been a lot more interesting last year, I think. But yeah, even then. exactly. So speaking of South Carolina, there is, they might not have these top teams twice, but they do have UConn this weekend. So they still have plenty of a tough schedule coming up. I think that one's going to be an interesting one. So South Carolina is on the road at UConn. So it's a home game for UConn. 
Um, UConn is still not going to have AZ FUD, most likely, for that game. I would say pretty confidently they're not going to have AZ FUD. She's supposed to get off crutches on Thursday, so I don't see yeah. the turnaround from crutches to playing being that quick. Um, that's, <laughs> um, that's a little bit soon. Are they going to have Ducharme? It's a possibility. The latest from Gino on that is somewhere in the next two to five games. So if it's two games, <laughs> <laughs> they would okay, have her. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't sound that promising. I feel like I feel like it's probably yeah. somewhere more in the middle of that timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, so still a shorthand at UConn, but I still think, regardless, even if South Carolina is probably very much expected to win this game, it's still going to be an interesting game in terms of how those two teams match up. Particularly, I think the front court battle is really what I'm most excited to see. Yeah, me too, because UConn's, uh, I mean, last year they lost twice by 15 plus. Uh, The first one was pretty close to the fourth quarter, but, and then you take away Paige out of that equation and I guess AZ, but the the front court's a lot better. UConn's a much better rebounding team, even if they're without those backcourt pieces in than they were last year. Uh, Like Aaliyah Edwards obviously took a big jump. Aubrey Griffin has been mm-hmm. huge, and like you, you have to have that. That's more important yeah. in South Carolina because, like, how often do we see teams against South Carolina, like, put five in the paint, like, just like completely disrespectful defense to all of their perimeter players, just like backpedaling on them, just daring them to shoot the three. They do, they miss. Well, usually they don't shoot threes, but. South Carolina throws up some shot that doesn't go in, goes and gets the rebound, puts it back. Like that's the offense, get it on the rim. But if you can prevent them from getting those second chance opportunities, like that's the one way that you can stop South Carolina from scoring is give them one look. Cause their first look, if you only give South Carolina one look all game, like they're a very, very, very human offense. And UConn's, I, their defensive rebounding has been really good this year. Yeah. Whoever's been in the lineup. So that's one thing that I think could be different than last year's matchups that I'll be looking for. Yeah. I think that piece is going to be interesting because UConn has done really well overall on the defensive glass, but then I think they struggled at Tennessee. some with that, they didn't play great. And I did watch it back and I think it was more like isolated to the third quarter. I thought they did a decent job most of the game. But I think even one quarter of being bad on the glass against South Carolina is enough to <laughs> get yourself in trouble. So oh, yeah. I think that's going to be a, a big thing is can they get, especially with the short rotation, like a, we might see one person coming off the bench in this game, like the way Gino's subbing right now and what they have available yeah. <laughs> to play like that against a team like South Carolina that can rotate size and depth for so long for 40 minutes, I think is going to be a, a big challenge. Yeah, and foul trouble. If you're yeah. playing everyone 38 plus minutes a game like Gino has been and almost has had to to some extent, but maybe would anyway because that's Gino. But I like when you have when a team like South Carolina who's just coming at you in waves with bigs and scoring in the paint, like it's hard to stay out of foul trouble. And mm-hmm. that's really important for UConn because one player in foul trouble and that game's over. Like UConn yeah. has to have their starters out there. Yeah, exactly. I think that's that's going to be a big thing. Um, and they're going to have to find ways to score, too, which isn't something this UConn team has struggled with much, except for with the exception of the Villanova game this weekend. They struggled a lot to score, but they also just looked tired. They've played, I think, yeah. tomorrow is five games in 11 days, and when your starters are playing 38 minutes apiece, it's a lot. Um, it was a lot. <laughs> But I think they've got to find ways to score, especially on the perimeter. They need, like, Lulu Pacentafil to knock down shots like she did at Tennessee. She had a huge game against Tennessee. And then I think they're going to need Nika Mule to step up and score some, too. Yeah, she loves to have those games with, like, 12 assists and three points, but they might Mm -hmm. need more like 12 (laughs) assists and 10 points out of her in that one. Yeah. Yeah, I think her having a game where she knocks down a couple threes, which she's definitely capable of doing, is is huge. I think things for UConn to win it a lot, things have to fall in their favor. They probably need Dorfing has to hit a couple of those threes that she can take and make people guard her out on the perimeter a little bit more, too. But I think it's it's probably hard for UConn to win this, but I still think we learn about like where this UConn team is, even without FUD in the game, in terms of like how does that front court match up, and you can kind of think about like what that looks like when you have easy fun on the court, say in a, a matchup in, in March that we might get. 
Yeah. Oh, you're, we'll definitely learn a lot. And I think you kind of like being at home is going to be a big event. I don't think you, I mean, obviously one of them national championship, the first game last year, I think was in South Carolina, right? Uh, I think uh, it was in the Bahamas. Oh, that's right. And yeah, the yeah. there's going to be one in South Carolina that got canceled, right? Right. Right. They're going to play yeah. each other three times. That's right. Either way, haven't played none of those matchups happened in UConn. That's a big deal. Uh, and I don't think that Don Staley is the type of coach that would let this happen, but South Carolina does have that LSU game looming over them the following week, which is it's not the worst timing for UConn to play them right before <laughs> that, you know, two games before that, I guess. Um, yeah. So there's definitely some things that could go in UConn's favor, but they need basically everything to go in their favor, I think. Right. To pull this yeah. Up. It's one of those games where like everything has to fall the right way, which I guess maybe that team is due for some good luck because they haven't really had much of it, but yeah. <laughs> It's it's gonna be a tough matchup, I think, to win. Yeah, we'll learn a lot, though. You're right. We'll learn. Yeah, a lot. yeah. I think that's gonna be the most important piece is what we can learn, especially in that front court matchup. I think there's been so much talk about how good Olya Edwards is and how much like Dorky you has and Aubrey Griffin have added to that UConn front court, but to see them against South Carolina, which I think is pretty easily the best front court in the country, tells you a lot more about where this team is at. Yeah, I think it, this is a good point. In addition to just learning about teams and learning about, you know, where teams are going to match up in March or seed lines or Final Four contenders and all that, I think that span of a week, South Carolina's two big matchups, we're going to learn a lot about some players who are up for some big awards and accolades and All-American and whatever because Aaliyah Edwards, Angel Reese, both get to go against the best front court that they'll see all year. Right. And that's going to that's gonna have – their performance on national TV in those games is going to be a big deal in terms of what kind of honors they get in March, both of those players. Yeah, for sure. I think it's the, the biggest opportunity to prove, like, you definitely deserve to be on those All-America lists if you can put up some big numbers against a team like South Carolina that's going to speak volumes to, to where you're at in terms of against the best in the country. Yeah, no doubt. So. So, yeah, that should be a fun one. I'm going to be there, so I'm excited for that. Let's go. Yeah. (laughs) So it it will be good. I'm I'm very much looking forward to that. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you, Calvin, for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, that's all for today's episode. Thank you for listening. As always, make sure to rate, like, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to or watching us. Also, be sure to subscribe to the stats site, herhoopstats.com, for all your NCAA women's basketball needs and WNBA stats as well going into free agency here. Also, be sure to subscribe to our free Substack newsletter for all of our best content in your inbox and follow us on social media at Her Hoop Stats on all platforms. Thanks again for listening.